Hello, and welcome to Denton's Tales. You know, I am always intrigued by the amount of things that are popular knowledge. Yes, popular knowledge. Everyone, everyone knows them. The dogs in the street know it, as the saying is. Some have been taught to generations of school children, yet they are totally wrong. In many cases, despite public knowledge of them, they couldn't be wronger, to coin a, coin a word. Showing that knowing something does not necessarily make it true. Oh yes, I, I, I know all about that, they say. Yet whatever it is that they're talking about never happened. Or if it did happen, it wasn't the same as the popular but nonetheless incorrect version. So, here we go. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to a friend, If the British march by land or sea from town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light. One, if by land. Two, if by sea. And I, on the opposite shore, will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and arm. Then he said, good night, and with muffled awe, silently rode to the Charlestown shore, and so on and on for quite a number of verses. Paul Revere's Ride is an 1860 poem by American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow that commemorates the actions of American patriot Paul Revere on the 18th of April, 1775. First published in the January 1861 issue of the Atlantic Monthly and later retitled The Landlord's Tale in uh, Longfellow's 1863 collection Tales of a Wayside Inn. Oh, stirring stuff to be sure. And I mean, everyone... Everyone knows the gripping and exciting tale of Paul Revere's midnight ride, shouting, The British are coming! The British are coming! In every village and town he rode through. Stirring stuff indeed. There's one, there's one slight problem with the tale, however. It didn't happen. Oh, I mean, yes, he rode. Oh, he rode right enough. That, that part is true. He got on a horse and he rode it. It's just the rest of it that's the problem. Yes, Paul Revere rode, but so did other people. But he never shouted, the British are coming, while he did it. And he never even reached his destination. His oh-so-famous ride was actually a total non-event. Now, the story goes that there were two signal lanterns put up. The British were, were coming by sea. And Paul Revere saw that and rode to Concord to warn the Patriots. Now, Longfellow gave sole credit to Revere for the actual, rather limited achievements of three named riders, though there were others whose names are not recorded. Revere and one William Davis rode to warn John Hancock that uh, British soldiers were marching to arrest him and seize the weapons that were stored in Concord, where the, the American militia's arsenal was hidden. In Lexington, they were joined by Samuel Prescott, who was a doctor from Concord, who happened to be in Lexington, engaged in... Well, well, Paul Revere wrote that they met him as he was coming from the home of a lady friend at the, as he put it, rather awkward hour of one o'clock in the morning. We'll, we'll, we'll just draw a veil of modesty uh, over that. The three of them carried on until they were stopped by British troops in Lincoln on the road to Concord. Prescott and Dawes were able to escape, but there, Paul Revere's ride came to a very inglorious end. The unfortunate Revere was captured and escorted back to Lexington, never having even got close to his intended destination. Of the three riders, only Prescott actually made it to Concord and warned the militia there. Further debunking uh, Revere's legend even more is the fact that outside of the Boston area, Nobody even knew who Paul Revere was, at least until Longfellow wrote Paul Revere's Ride. And during his lifetime, fellow Bostonians knew him only as a very successful and apparently popular businessman. When he died on the 18th of May, 1818, his obituary didn't even mention the oh-so-famous ride, which shows how famous it actually was. 
But he lives on in legend forever, galloping through village after village, shouting the British are coming, despite the fact that his ride was a total failure. He warned absolutely no one, and he could have made the same contribution to the revolutionary cause by, well, just taking a leisurely ride around the park. So the whole legend of Paul Revere's ride actually amounts to a pile of, well, what his horse probably left on the road a few times. Admiral Lord Nelson, great hero of the British Navy, was blind in one eye, and he wore an eye patch, and of course he famously put his telescope to his blind eye during the Battle of Copenhagen, saying, what signal? I see no signal. And Nelson, of course, is frequently shown wearing an eye patch over his blind eye. So a man in an 18th century naval uniform wearing an eye patch was instantly recognisable as Horatio Lord Nelson. The trouble is, he wasn't actually blind. Now, he had limited sight in one eye, having been struck in the eye by flying debris during a land engagement in 1794, but he never wore an eye patch. He had no need to, since his damaged eye looked perfectly normal. No one looking at him would have seen any difference between uh, his eyes. And in none of, the, uh, none of the very many contemporary paintings of him is he ever depicted wearing an eye patch. Yet, in more recent art, he is shown with that ever so famous eye patch. Somehow this, this idea came about during the 19th century and remains fixed in popular imagination. George Washington. Now, George Washington was held up as an example of truth and honesty. Oh, yes. Getting an axe as a gift as a boy. Who would give a small boy an axe? Yeah, oh well. And chopping down his father's cherry tree. But when his father confronted him about it, he was so honest. He freely admitted to the deed, saying, I cannot tell a lie. Oh, how noble. How noble. And there was indeed a lie. Oh, yes, there was a lie. The whole story was total fabrication. He never chopped down a cherry tree, or indeed any other kind of tree, and then confessed to it. But it made a very good story. It was actually invented by Mason Locke Weems, one of the um, early biographers uh, of Washington, and it appeared in his book in 1806, becoming one of the most famous and long-lasting myths about Washington. It probably seemed like a good idea at the time. The Emperor Nero, famously fiddling as he watched Rome burning, probably intoning one of his rather awful poems as he did so, uncaring, no sympathy for the citizens of the burning city, a popular image seen again and again, but completely invented. For one thing, fiddling would have proven a tad difficult in 64 AD, since the violin wasn't going to be invented for another 1600 years. Now, of course, he could have twanged a lyre as he watched the fire, had he actually been in Rome at the time, but he wasn't. He was in his villa over 30 miles away at Antium when the fire started, and he, he mounted a horse and rode back to the city as fast as he could, not waiting for the slow imperial carriage to assist with operations to fight the fire. And he took measures to bring in food supplies as well as opening the gardens and public buildings to accommodate those whose homes had been destroyed not the bad guy he's being painted. Now, I mean, he wasn't exactly a model of charm by a very long way, but he is totally innocent of the fire fiddling thing. Never happened. Marie Antoinette is famous for her so uncaring remark, let them eat cake, showing her lack of any understanding for the poor people of France, since if the starving peasants couldn't afford bread, they could hardly buy even more expensive cake. At the very least, it implies that she really wasn't very smart. But there is absolutely no evidence that she ever said it. And similar stories were in fact told of other nobles saying exactly the same thing. A German version in the 16th century, for example, where a noblewoman asks why the peasants don't eat sweetbread. The first person to use this specific phrase, let them eat cake, or actually brioche, as it was in, in the French, seems to have been the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau in 1767, who tells of someone that he calls a great princess who used that phrase. Now, Marie Antoinette was indeed a princess at that time, but she was only a very young child, so she's hardly the person he was referring to, 
And we really have no idea who he had in mind, or indeed if he simply made it up about nobody in particular. But it's a great story. And she never said it. America did not become independent on July the 4th, 1776. What, you say? But, but everyone knows the 4th of July is American Independence Day. Yes, yes, but... You know, knowing something doesn't always make it a fact, as I've said, though true enough, that date is always given for that event. But no, no, you see, while the Founding Fathers signed the Declaration of Independence on that date, that had no validity under British law. And legal independence from England was finally granted by the British government only on the 3rd of September, 1783, at which time the American colonies did become legally independent. Now, of course, to all intents and purposes, they had been for years, ever since 1776, but it was one of those little legal things that had to be tied up. So, from a strict legal point of view, no, America did not become independent on the 4th of July. The 7th Cavalry Regiment was wiped out at the Battle of the Little Bighorn on June the 25th, 1876, due to Custer's stupidity, the only survivor of the whole regiment being the famous horse Comanche, who can be seen stuffed and preserved, I think, at the University of Kansas uh, to this day. A very, very popular belief, uh, but I'm afraid totally wrong. Now, Custer divided his force of approximately 570 men into three groups sending Captain Benteen to the south to check for any further Indians, with orders to return at once if he found nothing. Major Reno was sent to attack the village from the southern end, while Custer himself took the rest of the regiment to attack from the north. Only the men with Custer were completely wiped out, about 260 in all, though Reno suffered considerable casualties, partly due to a panicked retreat across the river that allowed the Indians to follow him. A golden rule of Indian fighting was, do not turn your back and run, because they will, of course, pounce on you immediately. And he took a position up on the hilltop, where he stayed, and he was joined by Captain Benteen, who had disobeyed his orders to join Custer. Though ordered to return as quickly as possible, Benteen had delayed, trotting leisurely back and enjoying the lovely sunny day, I'm sure, stopping to water his horses, and even when a messenger came from Custer and told him there was a big village and that Custer's orders were that he was to be quick and bring the ammunition, he still made no attempt to do either, joining Reno and staying there. Now afterwards they claimed, well, they didn't know where Custer was, though they could hear the firing in the distance, and you know, even a city boy with no knowledge of the West could have followed the trail of 260 horses through the long summer grass. It would have been perfectly obvious. Plus, they had the messenger, one trumpeter Martini, who had just come from Custer with the message and knew exactly where he was. It is also a myth that Custer disobeyed his orders. He did no such thing. You know, rushing to attack, failing even to reconnoiter the Indian village, wanting glory and thus not waiting for General Alfred Terry to arrive. Actually, General Terry had ordered him to attack the Indians whenever he found them, and everyone in Terry's command assumed that Custer would be the one to get the victory. He was never told nor expected to wait for anyone. When Custer found the village on June 25th, which he never actually saw due to bluffs and trees uh, uh, keeping it out of his uh, view, uh, so he had no idea how big it actually was, he had intended to spend the day checking it out, reconnoitering and planning an attack for the following morning. But some Indians were spotted in the distance. His own Indian scouts told him attack at once or the village would simply flee. And Custer very, very reluctantly did so. That he attacked rashly simply isn't true, nor that the disaster was due to his not waiting for Terry. Even if he had attacked the following day, as he had intended, June the 26th, well, General Terry didn't arrive until the 27th, so that would have changed absolutely nothing. Except perhaps, of course, that had he actually seen the size of the village, he would probably have acted quite differently and probably taken the whole regiment in together. Of course, other well-known Custer myths also include that he hated Indians, that he attacked their villages and slaughtered the inhabitants, and that he wore buckskin to make himself look more dashing and romantic. Well, you know, he once said that were he an Indian, 
he would not agree to give up the freedom of the plains and the, the lifestyle that they, they enjoyed and be confined on a white man's reservation. Not really a statement uh, an Indian hater would make. And prior to the Little Bighorn, he only once attacked an Indian village on the Washita River. And far from slaughtering anybody, he, he observed some of his men firing at women and children who were trying to escape, and he sent an officer to tell them to cease fire immediately. He had no intention of, of harming those people. And in fact, he rounded up all the women and children and took them with him. And the buckskin. Well, you see, that was a common form of dress among many army officers and civilians alike. And a number of other 7th Cavalry officers and scouts were wearing it as well as custom. So, you know, he was far from unique in that. He would not have stood out in a crowd when the regiment was assembled because he was wearing buckskin because half a dozen other people around him would have looked exactly the same. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation of January 1863 freed the slaves. No. No, actually it didn't. You see, it looked good on paper, and it sounded good. It was really great. Oh, it had a ring to it. But, you see, it only freed slaves in the Confederate states. It stated that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states henceforward shall be free which, of course, had absolutely no validity in those states, and thus freed absolutely nobody. It, it didn't even free any slaves in the North either, for that matter. You see, it was, quite, it was quite legal to still own them. It just wasn't legal to buy and sell them. And that didn't change until 1865, when the 13th Amendment to the Constitution was passed. And by that time, when it was officially ratified and proclaimed, Lincoln was dead. He never lived to see the slaves freed. Another common myth, of course, Lincoln fought the Civil War in order to end slavery. No, he didn't. He wanted to keep the Union together. Slavery was a, was a side issue. And though he hated slavery himself, he didn't see black people as equal to whites. That's something there that's often overlooked. And he stated that, and I quote, If I could save the Union, if I could save the Union without freeing any slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. See, slavery, slavery had nothing to do with the Civil War as such. It was more like a, a very beneficial and proper side effect of it. You know, if, if Jefferson Davis had said to Lincoln, OK, I'll, I'll rejoin the Union, but we have to keep the slaves, Lincoln would have said, done and maybe then tried to free them by some means uh, after that. Germany started World War I, thus deserving the dreadful reparations imposed by the Treaty of Versailles, which led indirectly to World War II, despite President Woodrow Wilson's warning of that very thing, but the British and French ignored him. But everybody knows that Germany started World War I, right? It was that dreadful Kaiser Wilhelm, right? Yeah? Except that they didn't. No, the German Kaiser really had nothing to do with it. The Austro-Hungarian Empire under Kaiser Franz Josef started the war. Russia then got into it, and Germany was actually the third country to enter the war. Now, that, 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 that's the simple version. But, but a bit of explanation is really required. You see, the German high command were desirous of some kind of Balkan conflict that would involve Russia joining in against Austro-Hungary giving Germany the legitimate excuse of legally coming to the aid of Austria and unleashing the Schlieffen Plan, a plan that would involve a lightning strike against France and then a massive operation against Russia, because they were convinced France was at some point going to seek revenge for the defeat they suffered in 1871 in the Franco-Prussian War. But nobody in Germany had expected the Austrian Archduke and his wife to be assassinated in Sarajevo on the 28th of June 1914. But when it happened, well, when it happened, the high command gleefully saw their chance. Ah, Austria would be bound to attack Serbia, Russia would come to their aid, and Germany could then assist Austria. But Kaiser Franz Josef did absolutely nothing. There was no attack against Serbia. Weeks went by, nothing happened. Until finally, on July, uh, July the 23rd, Austria sent an ultimatum to Serbia with a, a list of harsh conditions that Serbia must comply with, intended, of course, to, to make the Serbians refuse. But to everyone's surprise, the Serbians accepted it, only declining one of the conditions. 
And even Kaiser Wilhelm was of the opinion that war wasn't going to happen. Austria couldn't really go to war after their ultimatum being accepted and having waited so long after the assassination. And according to some of those at the time, the Kaiser still saw the possibility of a peaceful diplomatic resolution to the conflict, not being as, not being as keen on a major war as were the general staff. But emboldened by their alliance with Germany and the attitudes within the German general staff, the Austrians, to everybody's surprise by that stage, declared war on Serbia on July the 28th. And suddenly, well, suddenly everybody started declaring war on everybody else right across Europe. Russia began to mobilize to support Serbia. Germany warned them to stop. The Russians ignored the warning. And Germany declared war on Russia on the 1st of August. France ordered mobilization to support Russia, and on August the 3rd, France and Germany declared war on each other. Not to be outdone, I mean, you couldn't miss out on a jolly good war, now could you, old chap? Britain declared war on Germany on August the 4th in separate of France and Russia. So, however much the German high command may have wanted that opportunity, and it made sure that the Austrians knew Germany would support them in the event of, uh, event of any conflict, Germany did not actually start the war. She came in third in the order of conflict in support of an ally, just as Russia, France and Britain did. You know, interestingly enough, there was actually a chance that Britain and France might never have become involved in the war, because Kaiser Wilhelm was told that the British would remain neutral if France wasn't attacked. And seeing his reluctance to enter the war in the first place, plus the advantage of not fighting a war on two fronts, which is always a very bad idea, he went to Helmuth von Moltke, chief of the German army, and the nephew of the great field marshal Helmuth von Moltke the Elder, who had secured German victory in the Franco-Prussian War, and the Kaiser told him to stop the advance against France, turn the army back from Belgium and Luxembourg and send it against Russia, thus removing any reason for the French and the British to intervene. But von Moltke refused, saying, well, you know, it couldn't be done, orders have been given, it would cause confusion which was rubbish. I mean, any order can be countermanded. And anyway, he claimed he hadn't got the ability to move the army against Russia yet. The, the railways, you see, the railways, unprepared, couldn't do it. But he never told the Kaiser that, in fact, the railways were ready. The entire German army could have been halted and sent against Russia. But you see, he wanted the Schlieffen plan to go ahead. Kaiser Wilhelm was extremely unhappy and probably, probably should have stood up to von Moltke. But he famously remarked that, had I asked your uncle the same question, he would have given me a different answer before storming out of the room. Had von Moltke done what the Kaiser asked, perhaps the British and French would have stayed out of the war, who knows. But the bottom line was that Germany didn't actually start the war and entered it quite legally, you could say, as an ally of Austro-Hungary, thus not justifying the repressive Treaty of Versailles, which led to the Second World War. They should have listened to President Wilson. He, he knew a thing or two. As an interesting little uh, tidbit of information, well, interesting to me at least, if not anybody else, I am actually very distantly related on my mother's side to Kaiser Franz Josef, the man who did start World War I. Is, is that something to brag about? Hmm, probably not. Christopher Columbus discovered America, a total falsehood, of course, that used to be taught in schools and generally believed by just about everybody. Of course, he didn't. In October of 1492, he discovered some islands in the Caribbean, and he couldn't even see the North American mainland from there. And despite numerous voyages around Caribbean islands, he never set foot on North America. So to say he discovered America... Well, that would be rather like having found the Canary Islands and claiming to have discovered Spain. Leif Erikson was the first European to set foot on the North American continent, so it was he who made the European discovery of America almost 500 years earlier, landing first in Newfoundland, then travelling on to the south, passing the St. Lawrence River and reaching New Brunswick, which he called Vinland, due to the wild grapes that grew there. Despite Columbus having nothing whatever to do with North America, many cities, of course, were named after him, and Columbus Day became a federal holiday, celebrated on the second Monday in October. And schools, of course, taught that he was, in fact, the man who discovered America. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. But during the 19th century, 
a lot of Scandinavian Americans who knew the truth of the matter started celebrating Leif Erikson. And in 1925, during celebrations to mark the 100th anniversary of the first official group of Norwegian uh, immigrants, they got a really big boost for actual history when President Calvin Coolidge told a crowd in Minnesota that it was, in fact, Leif Erikson, not Columbus, who had actually discovered America. And, of course, in September 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson declared October the 9th as Leif Erikson Day. It has been suggested that Columbus Day should be scrapped altogether and replaced by Leif Erikson Day, since, well, firstly, Columbus hadn't discovered America, and secondly, he wasn't a very nice man. Forcing the natives of the Bahamas into uh, slavery, he used excessive torture when he was governor of Hispaniola, and he generally decimated the native population. And you know, even the king and queen of Spain didn't think much of his methods. In fact, Queen Isabella actually ordered him to release some of the slaves that he uh, returned with. So I think getting rid of him would be an excellent idea. You know, maybe some of the cities named Columbus might consider changing the name to Erickson? Just a thought. St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland. Ah, yes, he drove those terrible snakes out of the holy land of Erin, thus restoring it to being really good and noble and proper and all that sort of thing. <laughs> yes, I, I doubt many people today would believe that, but it was believed in times past. He would have had quite a job to drive out the snakes, since he would have had to import some first, there never having been snakes in this country. In fact, the only native reptile in Ireland is the little common lizard. Adolf Hitler was a very ungifted artist, and he was rejected twice by an art school in Vienna. See, he, he just wasn't good enough. Though, of course, he thought he was. I mean, he was Leonardo da Vinci in his own mind. And his rejection by the art school set the stage for global conflict later on. You see that, you know, constantly in documentaries. But it isn't actually true. He was, in fact, a, a brilliant artist. His paintings of famous buildings in, in Vienna and in Munich are superb, but his talent was architectural painting. Now, he was very poor at the human figure. He tended to draw people more like matchstick figures. And he was told to enroll in the architectural section of the school, where they'd be happy to accept him, given his considerable architectural skills. But that required a school leaving certificate, which he didn't have. His rejection by the art school was for lack of a piece of paper, not lack of talent. If he'd had that piece of paper, well, the history of the world might have been very different. He could have been painting paintings instead of founding political parties. So there we come to the end of this look at all the things that everybody knows, but which never actually happened. I hope you enjoyed uh, the video, and until next time, I shall say... Goodbye for now.